Our next and final speaker today before the panel discussion is John Delaney. John needs no introduction, but I'll read the very, very brief one that he provided us. Um, John is the senior imaging scientist at the National Gallery of Art, where his research focuses on the development and application of remote sensing imaging methods for the study of works of art. He's also a research professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And he's going to talk to us about combining hyperspectral um, imaging at various uh, wavelengths uh, today. Thank you. I managed to generate a PowerPoint play uh, uh, file that is incompatible with every computer here, so <laughs> please pardon me. Okay, I'm exhausted from that last presentation. <laughs> I'm known for speaking fast, but I don't think I can keep up with that. It was very impressive. Um, what I'm going to try to talk about is actually uh, talking about looking at different imaging modalities, um, XRAF imaging and um, also hyperspectral imaging, reflectance imaging, where I personally feel comfortable. Um, this is a, a joint paper. Um, we are very fortunate to have um, basically Alicia Ginsman, who has basically helped out tremendously with the XRF uh, mapping system that you've seen, and most importantly, the interpretation of the data. We have a, uh, a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Kate Dooley, who's our expert, um, uh, basically chemist, we have a graduate student from GW, um, Damon Conover, who has done a lot of the data analysis, especially the registration, um, and has also got all the instruments to run together. And I kind of help out with the optics. So if this will not work, I have to do this myself. Right. So essentially, we're going to talk with a, a first um, review of what imaging spectroscopy or hyperspectral imaging is. Uh, we know a lot about XRF in the last series of talks. And then we'll talk about this multimodal imaging. Um, and then we'll talk about case studies, which is the best way to learn the potential of this method. So most of you have seen the slide before in one form or the other. Um, but basically, reflectance uh, imaging spectroscopy is a very simple concept. Um, in its definition, its formal definition, it's the collection of images in a sufficient number of contiguous spectral bands to allow generating the reflectance spectra at each um, pixel in the image. And the idea is then that you can go into um, the cube here. We have a cube of many different images at different wavelength. Pick one pixel value here, pull out the intensity uh, variation in all the different wavelengths after calibration, and plot them up and get the reflectance spectra as if you did a fours measurement at that one site. Now, from reflectance imaging, we don't get elemental information. We get molecular information. So we see electronic transitions, which gives rise to color. color. And we also see vibration, um, vibrational overtones and combinational bands associated both with pigments and actually binding media, which we can exploit. Now, we have um, a series of hyperspectral instruments that we've developed and adapted over the years um, to essentially apply to cultural heritage. The big trick is to get the sensitivity so that we can look under illumination conditions, which are not the Arizona sun. Um, during full daylight, but actually the museum conditions. And we've been very lucky to take them around to a few places in Europe, not quite as many as our previous speaker. But um, basically using the technique Damon's registration algorithm, we can collect small cubes, usually um, 640 by 640 pixels in hundreds of spectral bands, and then mosaic it together to a color reference image and build up our big image cube. And there's a picture here uh, showing uh, Kate Dooley doing data collection at the gallery where we collected 120 uh, cubes of this um, early Italian painting uh, that was, was, was uh, under investigation for potential um, uh, conservation. This is actually a picture showing the overall painting in detail. It's very large scale and 120 tubes that were actually um, uh, collected and then mosaic together. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the hyperspectral data set, especially in the near IR region, is the fact that you get a lot more information than just simple uh, broadband um, infrared reflectography you're all familiar with, which I understand is now called classic infrared reflectography. Um, the conservators all in the room can spot a discontinuity here. But essentially, you're left with this problem of gray on gray, and it requires quite a bit of training. 
Um, it has been shown by, by other groups, including the group at the Open Defizio, using their multi-band um, scanner, that creating false color composites in the infrared can provide a visual clue um, in terms of material differences. And you can see here the difference in the material here around the face of the eye. This is obviously a fill. And then there's some um, patterning in here associated with a, the paint buildup. In this case, the, um, probably the green earth, the terra verde that was used initially. But if you have the hyperspectral um, reflectance spectrometer ins instrument, you can actually get chemical information in terms of the reflectance spectra. And here I show the reflectance spectra off of a part of the f one side in the face where we can identify hydroxyl bands which basically map to gypsum, which is the ground material that we would expect for this painting. The suspected fill area, you notice, doesn't have this panel of three different hydroxyl bands. It has a shifted hydroxyl band, um, suggestive of a different type of material that was being used. So that's an added bit of bonus that comes along with going through and calibrating the data and getting the hyperspectral image set. Now, we've used this to look at a variety of other early Italian paintings in the collection, and this particular one that's gone, undergone conservation recently uh, by Giotto. And the color image is easy to see, and then you have the composite infrared um, image here taken in a variety of bands spanning out to 16, 15 nanometers and emphasizing um, some of the uh, aspects of the uh, terra vert um, and also uh, variations in what turns out to be azurite, which we can identify by the hydroxyl band. If you look in a detailed region, you can see very nicely uh, the Verdaccio drawing um, showing up. Of course, you're only seeing the, the, the black or carbon part of it at this part of the spectral band, but that's sort of shading information. And then this sort of washy painted material, which is probably the green earth, so you get information on the buildup, which you can't see so easily just in a monochromatic image. Now, our instrumentation, because it's been designed to be so sensitive um, for, for working under conservation conditions, turns out to be sensitive enough to actually collect luminescence information. So instead of just getting one, two, or three different spectral bands, or maybe even five in the multi-span spectral data that was showed earlier by Jennifer Mass, we can actually get a cube. So we did UV lights, the standard UV lights that you would use in um, a conservation lab, collected a hyperspectral cube, and this is a false color from three bands. But anywhere in here, we can pull out the emission spectra equivalent to what you'd get with a lab tap bench spectrometer. And for example, here, the white of the flowers is this sort of classic emission. The um, reflectance spectra in the UV suggests this is zinc white. This is not unusual then for this emission to be associated with zinc white. And we actually see emission associated with red lips and also um, with the blue, which is probably effects uh, of media and the filtering by the pigment, something you have to worry about. But having the spectral information is very important in sort of deconstructing and understanding what this fluorescence is telling us. So that's one aspect about the um, hyperspectral portable systems we have. Now, really what you want to do in the multimodal chemical imaging um, uh, case is to really solve the following problems. Um, we know that combining different imaging modalities provides new information. We do that all the time in our heads on point measurements. The question is what can we get out of it in the spatial domain? And we all have currently been building standalone uh, spectral imaging systems um, and scanning systems for each of the different imaging modalities. You bring one camera system in, you bring in the next with its scanner attached. So we came up with this rather, actually not very novel idea, which was to essentially combine all the instruments on one optical table and then use a scanning easel. Let's make the artwork move by a series of different um, detection systems and collect all the data. And this um, basically reduces the redundancy of building very complicated scanners and allows greater experimentation since we can quickly configure the optical uh, table. So we got a new easel. Um, the vendor supplier was Smart Drive. We worked very hard with them to get specifications we needed. It handles paintings up to a meter and a half by a meter and a half. We get continuous coverage. It has all sorts of different scan modes, extraordinarily high accuracy. And more importantly, it's vibration free and it provides a precisional uh, trigger information. So it tells us when to measure when we're at a certain spot, not the other way around. And this is the setup here. Uh, doing hyperspectral in our reference 
along the lines. So now we have two different imaging um, modalities set up. One is the uh, macro XRF scanner. We're using a vortex detector, and we're using the RTEX is essentially just the X-ray source, and we're actually using the little video camera to see how close we get to the painting. Um, and sort of typical numbers, um, the key number here is the integration time of 100 milliseconds, which is extraordinarily short. Um, and the scanning time, though, still is slow. For one square media, uh, meter, uh, meter, it takes, at a sampling of one millimeter, it still takes 30 hours. Whereas in comparison to doing the veneer and extended hyperspectral, going from the blue to 2,500, we're looking at only a few minutes. So it's still a big difference in terms of the quality of spatial resolution you're going to get out of this system. And I think the um, setup for our system is relatively easy. We, we set this, um, the RTEX up and got signal from it, optimized the signal, then brought in the, the vortex detector, and then positioned it optimally to get the most signal. So it really wasn't as complicated. Uh, we got a lot of good advice from uh, Kuhn Jensen, um, who sort of pioneered this technology with your stick and then help from Jeff Davis uh, at NIST. And Alicia uh, was obviously key in putting this together. And so I'd like to show you a few of the um, uh, case studies um, and talk about examples and the utility of these two different modalities. So the first one we're going to talk about is Cosmotor's Annunciation with St. Francis and St. Louis of Toulouse, um, which is in the collection of the gallery. And we'll talk about pigment mapping and IDE, uh, paint binder uh, media, identification, and something about underdrawing materials associated with that. And then we'll talk about Rembrandt in the workshop, um, painting Apostle Paul. And there we'll be chasing uh, Smalt uh, Blue. And lastly, we'll talk about this uh, Fragonard painting of a young girl reading. And we'll talk about different glimpses of a portrait which lies underneath. Now we're going to focus on essentially two of these panels in the Cosmo Torah painting, one of Gabriel and one of Madonna. <laughs> now in terms of um, the image processing technique for um, actually doing hyperspectral analysis, um, the technique consists of course of collecting of the hundreds of those spectral images to build up the cube, which you see, you see here. The next step is principal component analysis, which is sort of a standard technique many of the conservation scientists um, use in you know, separating their data sets into clusters. Now, mostly you work in one or two dimensions, um, sometimes three. In our case, we're dealing with dimensionalities anywhere between six and 26. And so the clustering is done in a higher dimensional space. And just to give you a feel for that, this is a projection of our cluster set from 14, uh, 19 dimensions down into three. And you can see those color regions, which are individual uh, PCA clusters that we've identified, which relate to um, unique end member spectra. So that's the analysis technique that we use. Find that PCA determines the diversity of the data, then find the pixels that are most interesting, and then do the clustering on the PCA space. And what comes out of that is a series of end member spectra which are shown here, uh, basically reflectance versus intensity for the pigments or for the uh, reflectance spectra that best describe the cube itself. And so the next step is identifying what these different um, end members relate to. And there we essentially use reference library spectra and um, some information obviously about what we expect to see. But here I have assigned the um, uh, the end members to specific pigments based on matches to databases um, that we have. And essentially you can see things like um, uh, the elusive uh, natural ultramarine, which is relatively easy to identify by reflection spectra, a little tricky by XRF it turns out, I guess. Um, you can also identify in painting here of cobalt blue, classic signature, presence of azurite used in the sky, versus the ultramarine, which is used for the robe. And then the presence of an insect base, that's about all we can say with reflectance spectroscopy by the end pi star transition of the red, um, of the tunic or the, the rest that she's wearing. Some ochre um, that's present in the hair and some lead white and ochre in the face. And then up here we have in the background, the first something we thought was like probably an umber, but will turn out to be copper resonate as you'll see in a minute. 
So that's just based on the analysis using the reflectance spectroscopy. If you actually scan the painting with the XRF macro scanner, we can make a series of uh, images which are um, all shown here. Here's the K alpha, this iron K alpha. Here's uh, copper, which is for the background, which we said was azurite, so that makes sense. But notice the continuation of copper down below, which is more consistent with a copper resonate than an iron oxide. In fact, there's really no iron in the background there. And we can see the cobalt in paint. And of course, the M alpha, which is surface, and um, the lead um, uh, alpha being mostly the surface as well as what's below, so the combination of the two and the lead. So if we just pick one of these in particular, focusing in on the copper um, spectrum from the XRF, where we did um, see copper both in the sky and in the background in the, in the uh, landscape, we can see that if we separate our hyperspectral cube and look at its end members, we get one spectra for the sky, which, as I said, was azurite because we can see the hydroxyl band and the electronic transition. And we can see that the landscape itself does have a, a, a very broad band that's a little more than greenish now, it's turned brown, um, that's characteristic, more characteristic of a copper, copper green pigment than an umber. And the XRF really showing us and pointing us in that direction in the map. So the combination of the two is critical. Now the copper also shows up in the book, but the reflection spectra really doesn't tell us anything about the material. All we know is we don't see the hydroxyl band, it's probably not azurite limitations of that modality. Now I'd like to switch a minute and talk about mapping binders. Um, we have published a paper on this, um, essentially separating egg yolk, um, so using the fatty acid component from the proteinaceous comp um, component of uh, animal skin glue or um, uh, uh, egg, uh, egg layer. And essentially the band you're going to focus on is a fatty acid band at 2309, which the Perugia group had, had published in one of their papers, versus looking at amide bands, which are here and here, which are associated with the protein content. And this is all done on the background of the gypsum ground, so we've always got something to look against. Now, essentially, in that study, um, what we essentially showed was that in the Cosmo Toro painting, um, two different binders were used. Um, this is good because prior HB, HBLC analysis had basically uh, hypothesized the presence of the use of a animal skin glue and egg tempera selectively for some of the pigments through the selection of about seven microsamples. And one of the things that was most interesting of the data analysis we did in the mapping was if you look at uh, Gabriel's head, you can see these areas of white highlights on the face. And of course, this um, ochre that was uh, for his hair, then white highlights in the hair. And in the x-ray, you can see these white highlights correspond to relatively high um, density, consistent with the presence of possibly lead white. And if we actually look at the map of um, the media, we find the strong signature for egg yolk, basically the 2309 band, showing up in the ochre in areas where we see um, essentially the white, but not in the areas of the rest of the areas of the face. That we find evidence for protein. Now, if you're going to use lead white, you'd use egg. But if you're going to paint with a white uh, chalk, you're not going to use um, egg because it would just sort of disappear. You wouldn't have, it would be a transparent layer. You need to use something like protein. So this kind of makes sense. But we're really basing this on the interpretation of where lead is, uh, lead white. So we went ahead and redid this. We scanned this area with the XRF scanner in detail. And this is a map now um, color-coded where red is where we find lead. Um, calcium is found where it's blue. And then the copper green for the azurite background showing up. And this is good news for us in, our, in terms of our hypothesis. Where we find the lead white is where we find the bands associated with the egg. And where we see basically protein, um, a glue, an animal skin glue, is where we're seeing the copper. So I'm, not, I'm seeing the chalk. So that's actually kind of a nice uh, result between the two. Now, in terms of the underdrawing, since we um, have all this information, hyperspectral information in the near AR, we can look at the reflectance curve of the drawing lines 
um, in different regions of the picture. In the areas here in the false color where the drawing lines are brown, appear brown, they have this shape, um, which is sort of like basically an umber type character. Where it gets very dense, it becomes very um, opaque, and essentially you see it flat. And this is a comparison where um, we're essentially looking at uh, through the blue onto areas where there's gesso beneath, no drawing material, and that's the reflectance curve you get. So this is the difference in reflectance here is related to the drawing. So we kind of thought maybe this was an iron-based drawing material, maybe in umber. The real key for that, because we don't have a lot of spectral information, is to look at the iron map from the XRF. Now, we're a little limited in the spatial resolutions, um, but you can see that in the drawing on the face for the mouth and the nose, you can see the lines lining up, and you can see a little bit in the arms, but you can see in general, underneath the ultramarine, where there's higher density for the drawing lines, we do see a lot more iron. So the hypothesis that this is an underdrawing material made that's iron-based, possibly umber, is, is supported. So again, synergy between the two methodologies. Now the last bit is actually uh, looking for smalt in um, late Rembrandt paintings. Um, one of the goals of a, uh, the NWO, a Dutch, the, the, the Dutch National Science Foundation, a late Rembrandt grant, is to examine the uh, degradation of smalt um, in these late period paintings. And this is a very large funded group. It involves Joris Dick and Kuhn Jensen. Um, it involves conservators like Petrie and Obel and art historians, um, and Melanie uh, from our group is also involved in this activity. We received a supplement grant from the NSF to basically do hyperspectral images, reflectance images, of these paintings that have been scanned uh, with yours' uh, extra scanner. Now at the gallery, since we had a scanner, we were able to do both of those together, and we've essentially started doing that process and focusing on the lo looking for this um, presence of smalt. And I'll show you a little bit of what we've learned so far. This is the, um, the painting gear, which is assigned to Rembrandt and Workshop. Um, this is a false color, um, basically uh, three band infrared uh, that we've obtained using our scanner in reflectance mode. And a few things that are interesting thing here is this strange arch that Melanie can tell you about, the repositioning of the arm. But in the lead L alpha map, uh, from the XRF, you can see that the original book very clearly, and you can see some other features um, associated with modifications to this painting. And you get a feel for the quality of the data we're getting out of the XRF scan, so the 30 hours were worth it. Now, in terms of looking for evidence for smalt, we're looking for cobalt, nickel, and arsenic. And so I'm just gonna go through these maps. And already you can see in the cobalt map some areas of the paintings that show intensity um, related to cobalt. And it's some, a figure up here you should sort of watch that's not in the painted composition. So that's the cobalt K alpha, arsenic, and then the nickel. So all three line up. So we'll just say that loosely those areas are definitely um, a strong consideration for his presence of smalt. So we can now ask the question, I've got my hyperspectral reflectance cube. I know where the smalt is that I can't see in the painting. Can I turn the problem around and actually pick pixels in the hyperspectral reflectance cube that, are, that map to places in the um, XRF map for smalt and then basically come up with a spectra and then search the cube? And I can. And lo and behold, this reflectance spectra from, obtained from an average of these areas identifies a bunch of areas in the painting in our reflectance um, cube that are consistent with the smalt. The problem is, is this really doesn't look like a smalt spectrum in reflectance. Well, we can turn this problem around the other way. But there's one thing we probably want to know about is what happens if smalt degrades. Right? So when the elemental maps, we can find even degraded smalt, obviously, because of the elements. But we're looking at molecular stuff. So we looked at the reflectance spectra from the syndic of an area which is visually degraded smalt and an area where the smalt is still bluish and has good character. And these are the difference in the reflectance curve. So when you lose the electronic transition, the visible, 
as Kate explained to me, it's not surprising you lose them in the near IR as well. They're both electronic transitions, not vibrational transitions. And so we should see a loss of this character. So now if we turn the problem around and say, okay, I want to look directly and probe my hyperspectral reflectance cube for SMALT, I'm specifically interested in this signature. And if I go query my cube of reflectance data, this is what comes back. It's a small subset of pixels that map to an areas that do have um, small to identified by macro X or F. So our hypothesis now is if you go dig into those little areas and take cross-sections, they'd still be blue, although the rest of the areas probably have lost most of their color. So now we have this molecular mapping and we have this elemental mapping and we can use them together. That's, that's the current hypothesis. All right, then lastly, I can see I've got less than five minutes. Lastly, we'll talk about a, a, fun, a fun case here. This is um, a painting which was known by, uh, by essentially by earlier infrared and by x-ray that there was a portrait underneath. This is the hyperspectral um, false color, and if you stare at this long enough, you'll see there's a person staring out at you. Um, we didn't get perfect separation, but quite a bit of information. If we blow up that region more closely, you can see the, the lips, you can see this little neck piece, and there's an eye here, an eye here, and then the final composition ear here, here, this is a repair, and a big mass back there. If we start scanning with um, the macro XRF scanner, we can look at the mercury map, which is what yours always shows, because um, the mercury map, tied, if you tie it to a vermilion, is, gives you a very clear-cut view of the face. And we recover the ear we're missing in the hyperspectral, and the lips, and the eyes. And then some dots background in this region. And if we put all of them together, um, we're going to say the titanium is related to Earth-like pigments, that in the obscured area here in the hyperspectral, there's something in this woman's or this man's hair. I think the gender is still open. Um, that gets put together. So again, using the two maps together is sort of uh, key to, to unlocking who the person um, or what the character was. So those are the examples of XRF um, and hyperspectral reflectance comparisons. And in the last minute or two, I want to shift gears totally and go just to the micro level for just a very small moment. This is some work that we were lucky to do with Duke University that's been recently published which is beginning to look at how you can look into paint layers using fast spectroscopy. Um, in my old days, I used to do a lot of fast picosecond work. Um, and these are guys who are doing femtosecond work, so I feel like I almost belong. But essentially, what we, they were doing geosourcing um, at the Gordon Conference of Ultramarine, which is a problem well picked over, and there are a lot of good people in the audience who have analyzed that problem. So we tried to get them to think about looking at um, the fact that they have a confocal uh, two-photon system that gives them confocal resolution. And since they're doing two-photon work, they can handle scattering and go into the material. So essentially, what they do, though, is having a pump and probe pulse. So instead of doing luminescence like was done for a two-photon confocal microscope to look at varnishes on Stradivarius, which was very nice work and look for luminescent pigments, they can look at pigments that have no fluorescence and use this decay of the excited state as the, mac, as the uh, marker for mapping. And we give them a case of a um, layered red on a blue background, ultramarine background, or they're mixed together. And these are cross sections that were done by uh, Michael Palmer at the gallery. And then this is actually the results of the, of the measurements taken with a pump probe system, showing you can see the red layer separate from the blue layer and when they're mixed. And down here is the same thing when you do it in the virtual cross-section mode, where you can actually, where this was actually a physical cross-section, this is the same piece imaged by the two different techniques. And then here it is in the virtual state, where you're actually being able to separate the mixed versus the unmixed without taking a sample. So that's kind of a, a bit of a promise for the future by using some of these methodologies to get at uh, more information like OCT for um, uh, scattering pigments. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, John. You're not part of the panel, so you get to stay because oh, I get oh, to oh, ask I questions. I <laughs> um, are there questions for John? Wonderful talk. 
Annika. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, in this particular case, we do know from, uh, from the conservator what resin was used, what varnish was used, was MS2A. Um, the uh, Perugia group has published that vibrational band, that fatty acid band, and that's well shifted out of the way. And that layer is relatively weak and thin compared to the paint layers. So yes, there is a contribution from that as well, and you have to take that into account, but it was out of the way. There's a question back there. Hi, I'm Kristen Watts from Villanova University. Um, I was just wondering if you've been able to see a difference between egg yolk and oil lipid profiles with your hyperspectral reflectance data? No, that's the holy grail question. Right. Can you, can you? <laughs> um, I will quote, uh, basically, I think that, that uh, this problem's been looked at a bit. I think it's very difficult. You can see egg, you can see oil. Uh, the mixtures of the two that we've looked at, it gets a little confusing. Mm -hmm. You're looking at shifts of that fatty acid component for the most part, and it's shifting by um, four and five nanometers. So, um, and, and we build our spectrometer to handle that. So I think we can feel good about that. But when they start mixing it up, it gets tricky. Um, and it also raises the issue of, I understand, I'm not a conservator, um, is that their use over time of maybe some oil-based type um, uh, varnishes or, or treatments that actually give, may cause some confusion as well. So that one, I, other researchers are probably better suited to answer that. Thank you. Thank you, so in the interest of time, thank you, John, again. I ask the panelists to please uh, come to the stage, and in the meantime, I will introduce uh, uh, the panel discussion leader, Chris McGlinchey. Chris also doesn't need an introduction, uh, but I really, anyhow. Uh, he is the Sally and Michael Gordon Conservation Scientist at the Museum of Modern Art. He joined the Conservation Department at MoMA in 1999 and leads the scientific section. He is uh, uh, the author of the chapter that's been cited before in the Handel XRF for Art and Archaeology um, book uh, that Jennifer Mass and Aaron Sugar um, edited, and he's an adjunct professor at NYU and has taught the ASC workshop on adhesive and consolidants in various locations. He has a master's degree in polymer science from the Polymer Research Institute of Brooklyn Polytechnic, now the Polytechnic Institute of New York University, and uh, was uh, definitely one of the first in our field to have uh, an XRF instrument, and so I leave it to him and to the panelists uh, uh, to really uh, lead us into what uh, promises to be a very interesting discussion. I want to ask the panelists to take their seats, and as they're doing that, um, I will only um, introduce the panelists that have not spoken before, but before I do that, Tiarna would be mad at me um, if I didn't make the following announcement. Um, please fill out the evaluation forms before you leave and hand them to her on your way out, and um, Chris will take them as well. Um, and that will be much appreciated. So it's, um, I wanna um, make sure that we are on time. I know people, it's Friday afternoon, people have trains and planes to catch or drinks to drink. Um, and there are a lot of really great um, talks today. And I think that it's, it's almost hard for me to begin um, with, with you know, where to start. But with, um, for example, with Jennifer's talk this morning, um, it was a great presentation. She was comprehensive yet constrained. Um, this is something that is, is very difficult to do for a new user of XRF. So this is one of the topics that I'd, I'd like to ask the group. Um, and um, Annika's emphasis on training, as well as um, Eric's, um, he put it very nicely about how X-ray fluorescence grows with the student. So those are some of the things that I'd like to um, discuss. But um, the other two panelists that you have not been introduced to yet are uh, Jennifer Jakai, 
who has recently started a position at the Freer Sackler. And Jennifer, do you just want to give a nod? Um, <laughs> She has, um, her academic training is in chemistry and material science, and um, some of her re recent projects are on the characterization of pre-Columbian resins um, in pre-Columbian Panama, and non-invasive analysis of modern paints using reflectance IR spectroscopy. And um, to her left is Leisha Deming-Glinsman, um, she's been a conservation scientist at the National Gallery of Art since 1987, and um, I think we all know um, well her, her deep commitment to X-ray fluorescence. Um, so, um, Misha, will you forgive me if I just leave it at that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I think that since Eric was the, the, the most recent um, um, speaker of the group, let me let me start with Eric and and ask you um, when you when you get those young students, um, um, how how do you temper their restraint from um, um, going overboard with a method that is so accessible? I uh, my educational challenge is usually not. Uh, invoking restraint. Um, uh, the, fact that the, the fact that the method causes so much excitement uh, is, is fantastic. Um, the lab that I told you about at the end of my talk is consistently the student's favorite lab um, in the whole general chemistry sequence. Um, and, you know, we're spoiled. We're, we're in this room and Everybody in this room is extremely capable. Um, our students are great. They are in the top 8% uh, of their high school class on average. They have 1380 math verbal SAT scores. Um, but the United States is 23rd out of 23 industrialized nations in math and science. And so um, we get students who are immensely talented and immensely capable and very ill prepared and so the XRF is part of a package of what we try to do to tie fundamental physical concepts to things that have concrete uh, reality. Um, I don't want to hog time, but the way we introduce the topic is I take my uh, 1980 freshman college headphone cords that are 10 feet long and I shake the cord at various speeds to build up a, a nodal structure within the cord to introduce the quantization of a standing wave. And you can see that on YouTube all over the place, but what they often don't do on YouTube is showing people failing at it. And that's what's really important. You get a student to try shaking the cord and try and build up that nodal structure, and they fail. And the reason they fail is that the standing waves are quantized. And it's that, it's that failure moment that generates the idea that yes, the standing waves are quantized and if we're going to build an electron model of the atom that involves stable standing waves, a la de Broglie and Schrodinger, then suddenly that's, that's the key moment. And what's great about the XRF is my research students, it's a separate question. How to, how to, and I give them Karen Trentleman's papers and I give them uh, your chapter from, from Jen's book. But for our introductory students, the XRF is just an immensely powerful tool for getting them to see quantized behavior in atoms and it's so much sexier than a flame test. <laughs> I mean, flame tests are boring. But when you can see that you can look at a Martin von Heemskerk painting and see, oh, there's orpiment there, and that may be characteristic of Heemskerk, um, and I can find out whether my boyfriend gave me a ring that's got <laughs> <laughs> certain things, that becomes a very powerful tool. So it, it's not a matter of restraint, it's a matter of cultivating enthusiasm. Since um, Leisha and Jennifer Jakai um, didn't have the um, pleasure of giving a paper, um, 
let me ask them if they're um, as as audience participants. Um, were were there any um, 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 you know ideas or questions or um, observations that you have to share? I was actually quite pleased with how everyone is concerned about educating people for XRF because I've been really concerned with the mass producing of these XRF systems that are just getting handed out and saying, here, go ahead, you know, and I'm glad. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I haven't been to too many talks where people are really concerned in discussing the issue. So what do you think, Jennifer? Jennifer? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> actually, it was, I, I, so it was something you were saying that the XRF can grow with the student, and I think it's really, it's, that's what it's doing with all of us in the audience, too. You all start out in your first painting, and you really hope you can find a red spot that has mercury in it, because <laughs> you know what that's going to mean. But um, then when you find an orangey area that has orange, um, that has lead and iron in it, and not enough of either to really tell you whether or not there's red lead present or lead white and what's exactly going on with the mixtures you might have in it. Yeah, That's yeah. when you start to question what you're doing a little yeah. bit, I think, the yeah. first time yeah. you come across. Yeah. Um, so so on, Aniko, um, on the topic of, of training, um, was there anything that you didn't cover in your presentation that you, um, in hindsight, wished you'd mentioned? <laughs> I think I think that um, you know one of the one of the things that we found is um, for um, in preparing to uh, accept our first class of boot camp participants, um, what was really important for us is to um, to find a um, we we asked people about their level of experience and kind of their motivation for taking the class. And I think one of the, the critical things that happens is that, that we often learn new things that then we don't get to use right away. And then two months later, it's all gone. I mean, I call it mommy brain for me, but not everyone <laughs> has that excuse. <laughs> but I think that, it, that um, it, it, is a, it is one of those critical things. We are facing a lot of new technologies that are coming into the field, whether it's you know, imaging science or a new analytical technique. And, and X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy is one of those things where um, I think it could be um, um, conservators uh, become very capable users of it. But we wanted, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do is to give people an opportunity to really be able to go back and then use it right away to keep using it so that it remains an active um, uh, engagement uh, and, and that um, people never, you know, that people will have less of a tendency to feel like, oh, you know, it's been two months, I, I can still turn it on, but, you know, I don't remember all these parts of it. And, and so that's the, um, I think that, that's that been a critical recognition that, that we need to create not just the training opportunity, but have a way in which we can think about the future of keeping people engaged in the technique and encouraging them to continue learning as they use it. Sort of like what's the extinction coefficient of someone's <laughs> recollection of some peaks, escape peaks, matrix effects. Um, Jen, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about the nuance of interpreting since you um, discussed it so beautifully in your presentation? And it, uh, you, 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 you discussed it so fluidly um, and it came so naturally to you. I think that um, it, 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 it might have, I don't want to say went over some people's heads, but a lot of care go, can go into interpreting um, data when you're looking at, say, um, shielding from layers and um, not misinterpreting peaks. Um, as an educator as well, how, how do you deal with that young student? Well, um, what I try to do in my classes is go through, and this builds a little bit on what Eric was saying, not everything that can go right when you're doing spectroscopy, but also everything that can go wrong until as when you have, I was talking about in my presentation, the sum peaks and they fall right where, in the case of lead, where cadmium K lines are and where the tin K lines are. I try to show examples like that in my classes and 
Also, when possible, examples of escape peaks and Compton scatter and diffraction peaks. And so all of the different physics that's going to be going on in your spectrometer that has nothing to do with the X-ray fluorescence data that you're trying to measure. Uh, another thing that I think is very important, building uh, again on what Eric said, is uh, this idea of trying to work through with the, the students what's happening when things don't go right. And so as part of teaching X-ray fluorescence, not only in the master's program in art conservation at Winterthur, but we also have a second master's program in connoisseurship at Winterthur. And so we have students that are training to be art historians, and I do X-ray fluorescence with them as well. And I, I tell them to bring in samples, but I don't give them any sense of what an appropriate object might be to study. And so they have a chance to see, oh, I've brought in something that's made of uh, material that's so low Z that I'm just not getting good data, or the surface yeah. is so rough, or all of the many different things that can go wrong. And I think there are so many educational possibilities in, in those moments as well. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. Um, and, and anyone can answer this question. Um, in your experience, how do you guide thoughtful investigations where, you know, obviously you can take the instrument, you can point it on anything, and you can collect data from that, but, but, but how do you guide um, research and technical investigations that are based on some thoughtful question? Um, do you, is it okay if I start with that? Yes, please. Because I collaborate a lot with um, a conservator. We have a research conservator at the gallery, Melanie Gifford. She's, I don't know if she's here or not, but still. But when we went off, we did a study on, um, well, we did it with Anko too, right? <laughs> Wilhelm van Elst, we, we did pairs and we went off and looked at the paintings together. And it was really powerful to be able to have her insight and her looking, you know, lo looking under the scope and then me doing analysis and maybe me saying, wait, I see a little bit of, I see aluminum, <laughs> anyway, yeah. I see aluminum and silica and potassium. I think there might actually be some ultramarine blue in yeah. these white feathers. And then she would look under the scope and say, sure enough, I see the ultramarine blue. And it, it, I mean, I think collaborations is really best in my opinion. And yeah, if I can answer from my former experience um, very recently at the Museum Conservation Institute where I'm often working with conservation fellows and interns and conservators from everywhere else at the Smithsonian who don't have these instruments at hand and are coming to the Museum Conservation Institute for help. It's certainly an iterative process to get the problem before we even get to sitting in front of the instrument um, where they'll come with a question and a third of the time the question is so broad or will take approximately 25 years of analysis to answer and the other times it's sort of they're hoping to build a six-month research project on it and you're gonna say oh well that's about two analyses yeah. and you know finding that happy medium ground um, together working on the project and then you go and when you have the project to find and everything you sit down with them in front of the instrument and I interns that would coming into MCI would often, the first thing they'd want to do in the first week or two was sit down and learn all the instruments. And I'd say, no, you don't learn, get to learn the instrument until you have a project to work on it. Because yeah. learning how to use it and then not using it for three months is not going to be helpful to anybody. But when they actually have a project that they can sink their hands into with the XRF, it's a much stronger learning experience for everybody. Um. I, I emphasized to my undergraduates that we don't, we don't breathe in a museum conservation space without a conservator present. Um, and so I, I, I tell my students that we're going to let the conservators drive the problem. They, they have something they want to know, and our job is to help them figure that out, and we may be able to help them shape it, depending on things. Um, and then the other thing, of course, that's, that's really interesting is, um, you know, of course, I know the least about XRF and they put me in the middle. Uh, thank you, Aniko. Um, so the, the, the trick for me is to assess, you know, who am I working with? If I'm working with somebody, I know my undergraduates, if I'm working with a collaborator who's got a rich amount of chemistry experience, then how we, how we talk to them is going to be different than if I'm working with a collaborator who has very little chemistry experience. And so what we're, what we're striving to do is, is find a way of, of making the process useful for them. If I'm, you know, with, 
Jennifer or Karen or one of these folks up here at the table or, you know, with John Delaney, I'm trying to download their brain and I'm <laughs> taking notes. Um, so, so the strategy for us is to have the conservators drive the problem and for us to try to identify how I can use that experience to educate my undergraduates and if the conservators that I'm working with know less chemistry than I do, how can I help them um, with understanding what we're looking at? I think one, one of the um, most challenging parts of uh, setting up a training opportunity on, on X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy was is uh, talking about, you know, all the other techniques that we're not training on. And um, um, we, you know, we're, we're in a situation that we have a, a range of tools available, thankfully, in our, in our laboratory, but I think in most, in most um, problem-focusing discussions, it is really key to understand you know, what is the question and what are the best tools to, to answer that. And, and that's when, you know, XRF is often suggested, but maybe, you know, and we might have a discussion about its appropriateness, and, and sometimes it has to be discarded as not, not appropriate for answering the question. Mm -hmm. So I think um, as, a, um, you know, as a collaborator, uh, it's important for us to, even though it's a very quick, fun thing to do, to, to be able to say, let's not do it, uh, just as much as it, it can be done. I would say um, one of the most important things that I've gotten out of collaborating with my conservation colleagues, and I'll give an example here of historic silver, something that we've worked on a lot in Winterthur's lab over the years, um, is that I have great difficulty interpreting my data without the intimate knowledge of silversmithing that the conservators have. And so I can see that the surfaces of my objects have been depletion silvered, for example, but I couldn't really understand uh, why I was observing this phenomenon in certain parts of the objects and not others until I worked with the conservators to understand how the objects were made. That was really critical. And the same thing goes with the conservation treatments and restoration treatments that happen to objects with over time. For example, the use of cyanide in silver plating and finding silver cyanides on the surface of my object, I really had to work closely with the conservators to interpret that data as well. How are we doing on time? Uh, uh, okay. 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 <laughs> no, I know. I, I saw that we're approaching this um, um, five o'clock threshold. So, um, yeah. No, and I thought that um, John's um, presentation um, that just ended was a, a very nice example of how these spectroscopic methods are dovetailing with imaging methods, um, resulting in very powerful. Um, ways of um, complementing a technical investigation and just providing such a more powerful tool that take us basically from um, a materials ID to suddenly learning how those materials were used. And I think that's when we're, when we're doing these kind of um, point and shoot methods, it's materials characterization and our ability to understand more deeply how the artist was using those materials is, is something that um, is, is, is not obtained from a single point um, of, of analysis. Um, I, I'm not sure, does anyone have anything else to, to add? I can... Yes. Um, <laughs> if you would, if, if you want us to bring an XRF or a fiber optic reflectance yeah. spectrometer to your place, or we have SEM EDS, if you have samples that you don't have time to run that you'd like us to run for you, or you don't have that, uh, I love working with people and uh, my undergraduates love it, so shoot me an email if you want to do things like that. So actually, let me, let me ask the group one last question, and I'm, I'm sorry for popping this on you at the last minute because it's probably hard to think of something, but um, in, your, in your career of using X-ray fluorescence, um, what were some of the notable surprises that just kind of struck everyone or took everyone off guard? Can anyone you know, remember 
um, you know, finding a bizarre element that they had no expectation. Yeah, I mean, I work at MoMA, so I find bizarre elements all the time. Uh, how about I share a cautionary tale? Please. Um, so um, I was looking at, um, uh, we're looking at a painting that's been recently uh, attributed to Velasquez um, at the Yale University Art Gallery. And uh, the, uh, we're using an Artax um, XRF unit, and the unit had been moved around, and I didn't check it. And um, we're gathering analyses, and, and I have helium flow, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, a Virgin um, Mary in a young form. She has a, a red robe, a crimson robe, and uh, I, I know that we had used the handheld unit on it a week ago, and I saw aluminum, but I could not see it with the Artax, with the helium flush, with a more sensitive de detector. So, you know, I, I, I started thinking that there's something really wrong with the instrument, and I was doing all sorts of checks, and it, it, it was this whole crazy bit until I realized that in moving the instrument, the filter got knocked into the path <laughs> of <laughs> the uh, excitation and basically removed the component of this, the, the excitation spectrum that would have excited efficiently aluminum. And so I went on this whole, you know, so experienced users do stupid things. And, <laughs> and you know, instead of coming up with a whole hypothesis of why Red Lake wasn't used, you know, in the virgin's robe, <laughs> yeah. or why my instrument may be malfunctioning. Yeah. It's just a matter yeah. of yeah. really checking. Yeah, no. Setup. And if anyone has any other comments to make in that in that vein, but I think that, um, and it came up with your presentation about, and and Jennifer and I were talking about this recently about knowing your instrument, um, know its limitations, make work on mock-ups, um, um, and, and this was very instructive in my involvement with the round robin sessions that that. Um, Karen orchestrated. And one of the very nice things about these um, physical samples that you have from round robin sessions is you can then use them as training sets um, for fellows and new hires um, as, a, as a way to test their chops, so to speak. Um, does anyone have any um, final thoughts to add in um, clever ways to get people to um, not jump into the deep end of the pool and, um, you know, kind of push their instrument um, on test samples. I think that we really like Ethafoam. <laughs> Ethafoam and Plexi, those are things everyone should start to analyze first. Yes, absolutely. And that will tell you what are those little peaks that are instrument contributions that are going to be in your spectra. So when you're analyzing something with low levels of those same elements, <laughs> nickel, iron, calcium, aluminum, compare those to your spectra of ethafoam or plexi yeah. and delight in the similarities. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would like to build on the ethafoam comment. Um, about the proper supports to use for X-ray fluorescence, um, Fisher scientific glass slides are filled with arsenic, which is used as a fining agent in order to get rid of the bubbles in the glass. So never use a glass slide as your support. I've had many, many people come running excited to show me how much arsenic is in their object, but <laughs> it's in the slot their object is sitting on. So. Same goes for the titanium oxide filling in most melamine-covered uh, tables. Uh, we've seen a lot of titanium in the uh, XRF boot camp in uh, Tonkas, uh, as, well, <laughs> as well as Indonesian shadow puppets <laughs> made prior to the introduction of this pigment, all due to the fact that we did have optional foam to raise them off. That optional foam was not selected. It was a very good teaching moment about calling something a 20th century forgery versus <laughs> exactly. a bad yeah. experimental setup. So I think these are all amusing examples from our lives that, um, you know, you can now avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could fill an afternoon. Jennifer, were you going to? I, I, I have also noticed the arsenic <laughs> and glass slides. And we, 
come up with a very wonderful um, description of previous arsenic um, insect repellents used on the specimen we'd looked at, only to find out that it was, yes, the glass slide. Um, as well as, uh, Rebecca, are you still out there? Um, turning your object over, just look and see what's on the back side. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. A nice okay. iron galling yeah. inscription yeah. Um, will give you very misleading results sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, and I actually, for those who do have more than the point and shoot available, um, XRF mapping, even if you don't have the amazing new setup the National Gallery has, I found that when you have low levels of things, that can be invaluable. Um, I was recently looking at some um, very faded painted textiles. Um, they were buried, they're um, archaeological textiles. And your eye can tell that there is color present, but not a lot of other techniques can. But we found by doing XRF maps of the area that that was the only way we were able to get enough sort of statistical confidence that we were really seeing small amounts mm -hmm. of iron there. And it was an iron earth coloring, for example. Yeah, yeah. So mapping is your friend. Yeah. Speaking of mapping, I just want to bring it back to the fact that um, with the XRF mapping, which I think is really powerful right now that we have at the National Gallery, um, XRF is, is elemental, it's not compound, you don't know structural information, yeah. and, and to have John where we can look and see, you know, exactly. do the hyperspectral imaging and find the structural information and complement it with the elemental information is incredibly powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a good place to end it. Yeah. I want to thank you all for your, your participation. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And now, um, Tiarna is going to um, pass the bag with business cards in it and everyone's names. And each, particip each panelist is going to pull a name out of the bag. And so Leisha... Um, we, we have a late entrance? No. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. So why don't you read the name, Leisha? Okay, and this is for our... New journal at the National Gallery, plugging it again, Fracture. <laughs> oh my God, can I read it? Mm -hmm. Rebecca Summerall, is that how you say it? Summer. Damon Conover. Oh. Gregory Bailey. I wonder if we could raffle off an afternoon with Leisha and, and John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me get my card in there. <laughs> John Scott. <laughs> And lastly, wow. Ibrahim Abdel Fattah Ibrahim Mohadami. Did I do that okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for your, your um, professional attention. And let me hand it over to Chris, who I believe has some closing remarks to make. Is that right, Chris? Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I just have a couple of upcoming programs to plug um, that we're coordinating here at the Lunder Conservation Center now that this is over. No rest for the wicked, so onward and upward. On uh, March 3rd, we'll be bringing Rusty Levinson and Andrea Kirsch here for a 6 p.m. lecture on their book, Seeing Through Paintings. It's free. Uh, March 13th, uh, there will be an all-day uh, seminar on HVACs in museum collection spaces. That's going to be run by Jane Klinger and the WCG. Uh, you can contact Jane uh, for more information on that. March 20th and 21st, we'll be hosting an Inca NA uh, artist interview workshop. Um, on April 7th through the 9th, uh, we'll be working with National Air and Space Museum, ICOMCC, the FAIC, 
and the Lunder Conservation Center to provide another conference, uh, Aluminum History, Te History, Technology, and Conservation. Um, that is being spearheaded by Lisa Young, who's here. You can talk to her more about that. And there's a um, post on the FAIC website about that if you want to register. That'll be followed on the 10th and 11th of April by a workshop that's out at the Udvar Hazi Center. And then lastly, uh, for the foreseeable future, on April 25th, we'll be uh, hosting a stain reduction workshop with uh, Richard Wolpers, uh, Bruno Pulo, and Lauren Fair. And you can email me about that if you're interested. And uh, Austin and Tiern are just going to make some final thank yous. I would just like to remind everyone that we are working towards a publication. It will be a Smithsonian publication of papers presented here. Um, it is a peer-reviewed publication. It will take a little time to produce. We hope to see it in 2015, to be honest, probably late 2015. And I think a number of audience participants may be contacted to be those peer reviewers, so I hope you're open to that. Um, I'd like to thank Susan Edwards, our conservation technician from the Lunder Conservation Center, who worked with our sponsors in the hallway, Hyrex, Panasonic, and XG Lab. And also to mention, again, that thanks to the AIC painting specialty group and our sponsors, we were able to organize this entire event, including the reception yesterday. But it would not have been possible without the administrative help of FAIC and the heroic and uh, exceptional efforts of Chris Weiner. So thank you, Chris. And I'd like um, also to join with Tina to thank um, all our speakers who really um, made this conference uh, so very interesting and the session, the session chairs. And I'd like to thank also the many people who traveled from afar to come. I was really surprised when I came and saw the list of people from Egypt, from Poland, from France, from Europe, and from the States, people I've never met before. And it's been a really, real pleasure for me personally. And I just hope that we will have another one of these meetings sometime again soon between ICOMCC Science and ICOMCC Paintings Group. Thank you all very much indeed.